When I decided to row across the Atlantic Ocean, the first person that I contacted was one of the only people in Ireland to have ever done this. And he told me straight away, he said, this is going to be 90% mental. This isn't going to be a question of how good a rower you are. It isn't going to be a question of how much ocean experience you have. It's going to be all in your top two inches. I was delighted to hear this, because I'd never rowed a boat before. <laughs> um, I had no... Um, I, I had no, uh, no, don't clap, it uses up the time. <laughs> I had no ocean experience, so this was, I was okay with the mental side. And I'm a big believer in, in life, not just in sport uh, or adventure, but that the, the, the body will truly follow the mind. And I genuinely believe if you, if you try and do something, whatever it might be in your life, if, it, if you've got the passion and you've got the courage and the conviction, your body will follow through and you'll do, you'll do what's needed. But the mental preparation, which is what I'm going to talk about for the next six or seven minutes, started for me in the cabin. So you're looking at the cabin right now, and at the end of it you can see pictures of family and friends around the pillow. So every two hours when I opened my eyes, straight away it was a, it was a source of, of uplift or encouragement, because I was seeing the people who mattered most to me in my life. Getting up out of the, out of the, the, the cabin, getting dressed, as I would have gotten out onto the oars and closed the hatch, the last thing that I saw was this slide, which says the difficult we do immediately and the impossible takes a little longer. And this was at the core of this trip for me. It was all about this. Jumping out onto the oars and actually sitting down and starting to row. On the bulkhead of the cabin, I wrote an expression that I first came across in Lance Armstrong's book, which is pain is temporary and quitting lasts forever. So the first couple of, uh, from the moment of opening your eyes, getting up and getting out onto the oars. The idea was to have a little bit of mental encouragement along the way. Once we were, um, once we were actually out on the oars, I suppose we did know that you know, we were going to go through some very low times and some very down times. So I contacted Tory's family and friends in Canada. We were living in Ireland at the time. And I said, I want you to write Tori a letter. I'm going to put together a goodie bag of letters, and I'm going to give her one of these when she's feeling low or feeling down. So I, I got all the letters and I read them before the trip, so I said I had an idea as to which ones would be good for certain times. And one day, we were, Tori was rowing and she had just got hit by a pretty big wave. It had picked the boat up on its side and she, it sort of, the boat didn't capsize, but it, she knocked her ribs off the side of the boat about 20 minutes after I took this picture. So she was feeling pretty down. I said, would you like a letter? She said, yeah, I'd love one. So I thought, right. I have one from her dad, great letter, very touching. Um, in my naivety, I thought this will do the job, it'll pick her spirits up. So I started reading the letter and a smile comes to her face and I thought, brilliant, this is doing exactly what I wanted, or what I hoped it would do. And I finished, as I read through the letter and I looked up and she burst out in tears. So I thought, fuck, this isn't exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, and she said, I can't listen to any more. And I said, hang on a second, there's a PS here. Her dad's very sarcastic. He said, be nice to the little Irish fella. You might have to eat him. <laughs> so I suppose continuing on this, um, this mental train of thought, it became really, really important at nighttime because it was crucial to, in a way, take yourself off the boat every night because we had 12 or 13 hours of darkness. And one of the ways, obviously I'm not talking physically in terms of mentally, um, one of the ways I used to love doing this is think about things that I'd done in my life before or things that I wanted to do again after the row. And I remember one night thinking about a trip that I took with my dad from Limerick in my hometown in Ireland up to Dublin to watch an international rugby match. And I went through every little bit of the day, the breakfast, getting the train up to Dublin, 
the conversations with people I met, the match itself, having a few beers before the game, having a few beers after the game, and the whole thing. And it became so much, re it was like you were literally in a bubble and looking at yourself rowing. And so much so that I remember, you know, coming into the cabin and Tori would say, you know, how was the shift? And I said, oh, it was okay. Or it was great, actually. Myself and dad went to Dublin. We beat Wales, obviously, 24-14. And Tori was like, say, say hi to your parents for me. And I was like, yeah, will do. And I closed the hatch. And I just sort of caught myself going, I just, I thought that was real. But this was really, really important, as I said, to, to just get yourself away from the sound of waves or looking at darkness or getting hit by waves at nighttime. Probably one of the creepiest things that I experienced and that Tori experienced was at nighttime. And it was about 20 minutes into one of, our, one of my shifts as I was rowing. And I got this feeling that there was pins and needles going down my back, down my arms, and just this really eerie feeling that somebody was standing right behind me. So I looked over my right shoulder as I was rowing, and I looked over my left shoulder, sort of expecting to see someone. And as I said, it was a very, a very sort of a creepy feeling, um, far creepier than the nut hugger I'm wearing in that picture. <laughs> and, and as I looked around, and I just saw the lower body of a man, black pants, black dress shoes. And I turned back, and I looked again, and he was gone. Now, some things I saw on this trip, I knew I was hallucinating through you know, fatigue, sleep deprivation. Like, I remember one day seeing a dog and a skateboard coming across the swell. <laughs> I, like, I, I knew I was hallucinating. This was very, very different. It was as real as me looking at anyone here today. So I finished my two-hour shift, and I went in. Same thing, how was it? I said, you're not going to believe what happened. And I told her. And like that, the color just dropped off Tori's face because she'd experienced the exact same thing about an hour previously, two hours previously. Um, and she said she didn't tell me because she didn't want to freak me out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, on the other hand, was more than happy to freak her out. <laughs> um, so this, this, this was tricky. It, it was uncomfortable. We experienced it again at another part in, in the row, and, and we haven't the time maybe this evening to, um, to go into this. Um, guys, I would love to, uh, I can see my clock counting down in front of me, I'd love to tell you so many more things about this trip, um, but we're, we're coming close in time, so I'm shamefully going to plug a book that we wrote about this trip. Um, <laughs> it's called Crossing the Swell, and it's in, it's in all the bookshops in, in Canada. Um, hopefully I'll get to chat to some of you later on this evening, so thanks very much.